Now we can start the second session of, of our today workshop. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Bartek Gardas. The pleasure is because in some sense he is my product because I used to be his supervisor of his PhD thesis. Of course, I, it was not a very hard job to do to be his supervisor because he is he's quite a clever guy now. <laughs> but nevertheless, my CV is much richer because of <laughs> him. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jurek, for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I'm starting the second panel, which means the remaining talks will be more uh, technical. Uh, than the previous ones, but uh, don't be worried, stay tuned, and hopefully you'll learn something interesting. And, and today I'm going to be talking about defects in quantum computers, especially about defects uh, in D-Wave. So let me start by saying that I, I think that already Bo and Danny made that perfectly clear that to perform quantum computing, one needs adiabatic evolution. Uh, so what does it mean? So usually we say that a quantum system evolves adiabatically when it evolves uh, very slowly. That's probably true, but uh, it's, it's still a very rough definition. So I don't want to go into uh, unnecessary details what a quantum adiabatic evolution is. Uh, personally, I like to think of uh, adiabaticity uh, as, I like to compare adiabaticity to the aging process. It's like the, Every day, uh, we look at the mirror, and it's really hard to spot any changes that might have happened during the night, assuming, of course, you're not strongly hungover. But, uh, but when you grab a picture from three years back, it will be almost immediately obvious that so many things have changed. And this is basically what the adiabatic evolution is all about. Locally, everything looks static, as if nothing really changes, uh, but globally, over... Uh, long period of time, you can see uh, that a lot of things uh, have changed. So at this point, we could, we could ask, is it always possible to make a quantum system to evolve adiabatically? And of course, I can imagine a situation where even a small change is done to a quantum system would be so severe that I will lose entirely the control over its evolution. That can happen, of course. So I don't want to talk about that kind of systems here. But uh, there's yet another scenario that can, that can uh, occur. And so imagine that your evolution is adiabatic, but not entirely. Uh, so there's going to be a period of time during the, which the system cannot, for some reasons, evolve in an adiabatic way. So uh, so first question that we should be asking ourselves at this point is, um, can we actually realize such systems in D-Wave? And the uh, well, short answer is yes, we can. And here you can see uh, primary examples of that. On the left, uh, there's actually a, this is actually a chain of qubits. This is a one simple string of qubits. So I'm taking the one qubit and, and, and connecting that to the second one to its nearest neighbors. And you can see that even probably more, in a more clear way uh, on the right. So, this system is called, by us physicists, a quantum Ising model. This one in particular is called a transverse Ising model. And speaking of uh, being mathematic about it, uh, the Hamiltonian looks like this. It's, of course, it, the system is time dependent. You have two functions uh, called delta and epsilon uh, that depend on, on time, of course. And as you can see what happens here, and this is exactly what happens in general in D-Wave. I'm going to describe that shortly. Uh, for this particular model, but what I'm going to say next will be true for all uh, couplings that you can imagine uh, realizing in D-Wave. So at the beginning, uh, as you can see, this guy over here dominates. So the interaction between qubits is basically negligible, and the magnetic field uh, is huge. And as a result of that, of this, uh, my all spin spins will be pointing in a one, in this case, x direction. And this is a very nice situation because, well, this is the quantum state that I can actually prepare in, in, in D-Wave. It's extremely easy to, to arrange spins 
to point like this. But the other, on, on the other hand, this state is, is completely useless for calculations because I have no interaction between qubits because this guy over here is, is basically zero. So to make some processing, to process information, I need uh, non-zero couplings. And this is exactly what happens in D-Wave next. As you can see, I'm lowering this, this magnetic field and at the same time, I, I'm, I'm increasing the interaction between qubits. So you could, you could say that, in principle, your capability of performing uh, computation uh, increases as you increase this uh, coupling between qubits, right? And presumably, in D-Wave, what happens is that this evolution is, is adiabatic. So this S parameter here is just time divided by something which is called the annealing time. And you can think of it as being uh, one D-Wave processor cycle. So we all understand for classical computing that processor, uh, processors operate uh, over cycles. So for D-Wave, uh, time necessary to complete one cycle is called the annealing time. And we, of course, assume that during this evolution, the system will remain uh, in the adiabatic, adiabatic evolution. So, so assume now for a moment that I cannot actually satisfy this condition. Uh, there's, and as a result of that, there's going to be a, a lack of adiabaticity. And I will create, as a result, I will create something which is called defects, right? Uh, so there's a theory behind those defects. It's, it's called a Kibel-Jurek mechanism. Uh, after uh, Kibel that passed away a couple of weeks ago, actually. It's a real loss. And Wojciech Zurek, that is currently my mentor in Los Alamos. And basically, this theory predicts that the number of topological defects uh, should scale as a function of the speed. And now, we can actually understand what really happens here. So, the system I've been talking about is system that undergoes a quantum phase transition. So, there is a specific value of a parameter that I'm changing. Uh, and when I'm crossing this specific value, the system changing ch is changing phases. So it's like ch the system is changing, changing its very nature, I, I basically dealing with a different system after crossing the critical point. And what is really exciting about that is uh, the number of uh, topological defects that uh, I will create at the end of my evolution uh, only depends on the speed at which I'm crossing this critical point. And let me say, let me emphasize something before I uh, proceed any further. Uh, by defects, I don't necessarily mean something which is bad for quantum computers. It's only a name. I actually, I should refer to them as topological defects, but the name it would maybe probably be uh, more confusing than it already is, so I just leave it, as, leave it as, as, as defects. But keep in mind that defects do not mean something which is, which is, which is bad. And of course, uh, I know the scheduling, uh, D-Wave scheduling, so I know how those delta and epsilon functions change uh, over time, so I can deduce what the speed is. And the speed, of course, will depend on both couplings between qubits and the annealing time, which again is the time necessary to perform one uh, uh, one cycle. And we've done that. Uh, so let me uh, walk you through uh, by this some very simple analysis. So, so if there are no topological defects at the end, my energy at the at the end for my model would be simple, uh, simply given by this formula, which is kind of obvious if you think about it. So this is just a number of, of couplings that I have times the energy of the individual, individual qubit. Uh, so if I create one defect, my energy will increase by this number. And that's something that should also be obvious because you know, I had a spin pointing out, and right now I have a one spin pointing down. So my energy increases by exactly two times the, the number of uh, individual energy. So I can imagine if I have uh, n defects, and if I can uh, measure the energy, I can actually write down a very simple formula for the number of topological defects and the, the end in D-Wave. And what is very cool about it is that this is something, this, this energy, E of, uh, of annealing time, this is something that I, I can read indirectly from D-Wave, even from the API that Danny presented. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, by defect, you mean that like, up, 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 
Yeah, that's right. I, I, I should have mentioned that probably. So uh, at the end, uh, I will have strings of spins. And every time when the spin changes direction, I count that as a defect, right? So that's, that's right. Thank you, Danny. Uh, so that's, th that's basically what theory uh, tells you. And this is, this is how the real experiment really uh, looks. So those uh, red dots are the number of topological defects uh, directly measured in D-Wave. I mean, we measure the energy, and, and then we calculated the number of topological defects uh, using the formula I just showed you. And uh, this uh, green uh, line is theoretical predictions. And as you can almost immediately see, something is wrong here. Uh, and to be honest, this is something that was to be expected because, well, keeble jurek mechanism and many theory that we currently have are a theory that concern with closed quantum systems. And unfortunately, D-Wave uh, is a real chip, which means I cannot neglect any more processes like uh, heat exchange or decoherence so I have to somehow take them into account. But the problem is we don't know how to do that. This is a really exciting problem because, well, it's ha something's happening and we don't have clear answer what it is. And what me s uh, let me only say that uh, there are some aspects of this plot that we do understand. I don't want to talk about them uh, further. I just wanted to show you how ca uh, what kind of problems you can address with D-Wave, what kind of questions you can pose. Uh, but there are also many problems that we honestly don't know how to address. And let me be clear about something. This is really hard to simulate classically, and the primary reason for that is uh, this is quantum many-body time-dependent stiff system. So good luck, basically, right? But uh, as you can see, there are, there are many features that are really nice. Like, for example, there is clearly some uh, some function, so the scaling survives uh, decoherence. So even though we cannot predict, so the number of topological defects is roughly of the same order, which is a good thing, uh, but on the other hand, the match is not perfect, which also uh, tells you something. Uh, but actually, if you, when you, if you compare them, the slope, Theoretical predictions uh, predictions uh, says that we should see 0.5. We are getting 0.41. So the, all the error bars are actually negligible here, and the number of uh, the absolute value of topological defects also is not not perfect. Okay. So, but I, I think I, I'm going to finish here. Let me only say that this is something that we've been working at Los Alamos, and if you have any idea, any idea how to solve it, well, give me a call. And uh, so. I, I think I will devote uh, the rest of my talk to, to question. Thank you very much. Do you worry about the, the, uh, this A correction or the slope? Because it's quite good, yeah? 0 0.41, 0 0.5. This phenomenological theory at the end, yes? So actually, it's it's not phenomenological theory. We, we for the Ising model, we have X solution uh, obtained by Jacek Jarmaga from uh, University Jagiellonia University. So it's not phenomenology, uh, phenomenological theory, and I think both of them are important. But there are many different problems that I haven't mentioned. Is that in this regime we should you should we should be seeing some uh, curvature of, of of this plot, and we are not seeing that. So that also uh, tells you something. Right. So at this point, we should we should be looking very closely to both of them. Come on, guys. Okay, just a silly question. How many runs of the... of uh -huh. points you, you've done? 500 for each. For each point? Yes. Okay, so it's all on the, up, the average of the, of the runs. That's right, that's right. Uh, but like I said, uh, error bars are basically negligible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the, exactly the question that uh, uh, Piotrek asked. So we average them over different runs. 
So, but let, let me say something. This is not a D wave problem. I, 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 I think so. We do. We don't really have a comprehensive theory to compare with. That, that's that's the issue here. D wave is giving us some data, and we have some rough theory which is based on closed quantum systems. So, and we've been trying to figure that out. Uh, you mean di different? Di di so, so, what do you mean by by different configurations? Because D-Wave, as I learned recently, gives you a set, let's say, 100 solutions. Well, it's quantum. Well, you you do statistics over the, the, this data, so you basically you average them. So you I, well, so I get like ener energy per point five with probability. 75%, let's say, and then something something else. So you do usual quantum mechanical averaging. So that's it. What is the variance for this? Do you have well, uh, very small, negligible in this plot. So the formula that you showed a few slides earlier uh, gave the number of defects being both a function of if it's dependent on the Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's th 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 that's right. So to to present you with this formula, I just assumed that all couplings were e uh, were equal. But in principle, you can you can you can you can change them, and of course the speed will depend on that as well. But we get we basically we've been getting the best uh, possible results, uh, setting the biggest possible value of j, and and we we do believe we understand why that is the case. Uh, yeah, so, so this is this is uh, this is the problem that I've been working on currently, and and it's it's difficult. I I, I, I cannot really say at this point. Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Thanks, guys.